May, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks for another time we have to share your word, uh, to, sh to look into the history of what transpired in heaven that has had such an effect upon our lives this day and uh, your that call forth your great sacrifice for us to enable us to be partakers of uh, the glory that was lost to us, Father, we, uh, we ask uh, you to be our teacher, our guide in this year's study, and uh, help us to have a, a deeper understanding of um, what's gone wrong with this year world and our lives and what's gone wrong with the universe, and to know that uh, you're restoring all things. And uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So since last week, I uh, done the diagram. I'll just go down to it. But, um, it's, it's like a, a recap of last week, and it's just putting the events on to uh, a line. So we have here a sequence of events relating to the fall of Lucifer. So we had on the, uh, the left here, we have the beginning where we see there's a harmonious state of heaven that exists for ages, as Elmite says. And uh, so this this year's study is called The Beginning of the Great Controversy, according to Elmite. And we read there that there was a harmonious state of heaven for existing for ages. And then the father consults with his son regarding the formation of man. And Lucifer then became envious of the son and believed that he also should have been involved in the consultation. And then Lucifer's desire for self-exaltation self gradually increased. And angels pleaded with Lucifer uh, concerning his disaffection. And the father also sort of showed his righteousness of his law uh, as well to Lucifer. And then, sort of as a result of this, the heavenly host is assembled, where Christ is honoured as equal with the Father. It seems to be that there was some people weren't, uh, the, the angels weren't sure as the status of Christ, but God was sort of, the Father was sort of saying that he is uh, to be worthy of praise, that he is uh, as equal with him. And in that there uh, assembly, uh, Lucifer again uh, felt the love of God. He was involved in that worship in that there time, and he had that love thrill his being. But after that, pride and envy began to return, and the indulge in that again. And then Lucifer leaves his place and convenes an assembly with the angels. And Lucifer spreads this disaffection and gains support. So he's sort of saying things like, uh, this is making that we're having to do worship Christ is like a uh, slavery, or in a sense, it's like uh, putting us under yoke. We're holy. We don't need the law. You know, we're, we're kind of uh, holy in ourselves. We don't need to obey God's law. And then after bearing long with Lucifer, God presses him as to his decided course. And Lucifer nearly decides to return to allegiance to God. Uh, he had the opportunity to repent and to be restored back to the, the place as uh, the leading archangel. But his pride forbade him. And at that their point, Ellen White says, Lucifer became Satan, the adversary that his course uh, was decided at that their time. Uh, loyal angels then uh, seek to seek reconciliation, but Lucifer denounces them as slaves. Uh, the, loyal angel, the loyal angels counsel the rebellious angels which had uh, joined themselves with Lucifer to repent and to consider, uh, uh, and some were kind of uh, leaning towards what the loyal angels were saying, 
Uh, but then Satan binds the wavering angels to himself by claiming that they had gone too far to repent. Uh, this was true for Satan, but it was not true for the other angels. So the other angels, they were some were sort of thinking, I can go back here, should I do this here? They were almost convinced, and then Satan deceives them again. And the warning of the, the loyal angels is rejected. And then uh, I think that's where we, we left off. Near enough, I think, a horn. A God the Father and the Son then confer to determine what is the best good for the loyal angels. And God gives the rebellious an equal chance to measure strength with the Son and his loyal angels. Now, we haven't got into this here. This is their stage. We're going to read about this. And every angel is to choose his own side. And uh, it's going to be manifested to you all what side he's on. And then it talks about the, the angel are going to be marshaled into companies. The heavenly hosts are, are going to be summoned to appear before the Father to have each case determined. And then this year, there's some conflict ensues. And this year, I think with the strength of God is, is more stronger than the rebellious angels, the Son of God, and the loyal angels prevail, and Satan and the sympathizers are expelled from heaven. So that's just like a recap of uh, what we covered last week, except for that last bit. So we haven't really, we'll just sort of uh, look into that now. So this is from Ezekiel. It says, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. So I have this here with violence. I'm sort of paralleling it with what it says in Revelation chapter 12, when there was war in heaven. So uh, the paragraph continues. Uh, the loyal angels hasten speedily to the Son of God and acquaint him with what is taking place among the angels. They find the Father in conference with his beloved Son to determine the means by which, for the best good of the loyal angels, the assumed authority of Satan could be forever put down. The great God could at once have hurled this arch deceiver from heaven, but this was not his purpose. He would give the rebellious an equal chance to measure strength and might with his own son and his loyal angels. In this battle, every angel would choose his own side and be manifested to all. If God had exercised the power to punish this chief rebel, disaffected angels would not have been manifested. Hence, God took another course. He would manifest distinctly to all the heavenly hosts his justice and his judgment. All heaven seemed to be, uh, all heaven seemed in commotion. The angels were marshaled in companies, each division with a higher commanding angel at their head. Satan was warring against the law of God because ambitious to exalt himself and unwilling to submit to the authority of God's son, heaven's great commander. Uh, Theodore, could you maybe read the next paragraph for me, please? Okay. All the heavenly hosts were summoned to appear before the father to have each case determined. Satan unblushingly made known his disaffection that Christ should be preferred before him. He stood up proudly and urged that he should be equal with God and should be taken into conference with the Father and understand his purposes. God informed Satan that to his son alone he would reveal his secret purposes. And he required all the family in heaven, even Satan, to yield him implicit, unquestioned obedience. But that he, Satan, had proved himself unworthy a place, exclaimed, These are with me. Will you expel these also and make such a void in heaven? He then declared that he was prepared to resist the authority of Christ and to defend his place in heaven by force of might, strength against strength. Good angels wept to hear the words of Satan and his exalting boasts. God declared that the rebellious should remain in heaven no longer. 
Their high and happy state had been held up on condition of obedience to the law, which God had given to govern the high order of intelligences. But no provision had been made to save those who should venture to transgress his law. The Son of God, the Prince of Heaven, and his loyal angels engaged in conflict with the arch-rebel and those who united with him. Okay, thank you. There has been some, I remember the amazing facts doing a thing with uh, Lucifer that called the Cosmic Conflict. And mm. they had Satan and the angels sort of like um, with swords fighting, like lightsabers or something like that, uh, fighting each other. And then I've heard other people say, no, this is purely a war concerning words. It was a, a war in the sense of an argument. Who was going to be an, uh, the victor in a, in a reasonable understanding type aspect of debate? But I think in, in, when reading this here passage, we do see that there is some, F, some element of might and strength mm -hmm. being involved. They probably uh, didn't use lightsabers, though. Probably not lightsabers, no. <laughs> but we do see, I think there is like some element of physical force being applied uh, with angels against angels. They're measuring that strength, that might with each other. And uh, so there is a, a debate aspect to it, but there is also a physical thing, which uh, they have to be, they're, they're saying they are by force of might and strength uh, that Satan tried to uh, sort of have his, uh, to have some means of victory in that. So the next paragraph says, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. So the Son of God and true loyal angels prevailed. Satan and his sympathizers were expelled from heaven. All the heavenly hosts acknowledged and adored the God of justice. Not a taint of rebellion was left in heaven. All was again peaceful and harmonious as before. Angels in heaven mourned the fate of those who had been their companions in happiness and bliss. Their loss was felt in heaven. And we have that diagram. Now it continues. The father consulted Jesus in regard at once. Uh, uh, in regard at once carrying out their purpose to make man to inhabit the earth. He would place man upon probation to test his loyalty before he could be rendered eternally secure. If he endured the test wherewith God saw fit to prove him, he would eventually be equal with the angels. He was, he was to have the favour of God and he was to converse with angels and they met and they with him. He did not see fit to place them beyond the power of disobedience. And then have the earth and man are then created. So after the earth was created and the beasts upon it, the Father and the Son carried out their purpose, which was designed before the fall of Satan to make man in their own in their own image. They had wrought together in the creation of the earth and every living thing upon it. And now God says to his Son, let us make man in our own image. And so there's another section there. Does anyone want to read? <laughs> okay. All right, okay. So uh, Selby's going to read here. Um, the unhappy condition. Yeah, just uh, on your, just, uh, okay. The unhappy condition of Satan and the angels that were cast out of heaven. Satan stood in amazement at his new condition. His happiness was gone. He looked upon the angels who with him were once so happy, but who had been expelled from heaven with him. Before they fall, not a shade of discontent had marred their perfect bliss. Now all seemed changed. Countenances which had reflected the image of their maker were gloomy and despairing. Strife, discord, and bitter recrimination 
were among them. Previous to their rebellion, these things had not been unknown in heaven. Satan now behold the terrible results of his rebellion. He shuddered and he feared to face the future and to contemplate the end of these things. The hour of joyful, happy songs of praise to God and his dear son had come. Satan had led the heavenly choir. He had raised the first note that all the angelic hosts united with him and glorious strains of music had resounded through heaven in honor of God and his honor, honor of God and his dear son. But now, instead of strain, instead of strains of sweetest music, discord and angry words fall upon the ear of great rebel leader. Where, where was he? Was it not all horrible, a uh, horrible dream? Was he shut out of heaven? Were the gates of heaven never more to open and admit him? The hour of worship draw nigh, where the bright and holy angels bow before the Father. No more will he unite in heavenly song. No more will he bow in reverence and holy awe before the presence of the eternal God. Could he be again as he was when he was pure, true and loyal? Gladly would he yield up the claims of his authority. But he was lost beyond redemption for his presumptuous rebellion. And this was not all. He had led others to rebellion and to the same lost condition with himself. Angels who had never thought to question the will of heaven or refuse obedience to the law of God till he had put into their minds, presenting before them that they might enjoy a greater good and a higher and more glorious liberty. This had been the sophistry whereby he had deceived them, a responsibility where rest upon him from which he would fail be released. These spirits have become turbulent with disappointed hopes. Instead of greater good, they were experiencing the sad results of disobedience and disregard of the law. Never more would he would these unhappy beings be swayed by the mid mild rule of Jesus Christ. Never more would their spirits be stirred by the deep earnest love, peace and joy which his presence had ever inspired in them to be returned to him in cheerful obedience and revelational honor. Okay, thanks, uh, Sylvie. So Satan's cast out. It looks as if he's just, I don't know where he, he gone, he's gone to. When you read Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it seems to be as if he's cast to the earth. But uh, then the reading is here, the earth hasn't created yet. And he's, he's just been cast out of heaven. And he's in a, in a lost condition mm. with other angels and feeling the uh, sort of culpability that he has, has caused others to be in that sort of position as he is. Uh, so Satan repents before Christ. Satan trembled as he viewed his work. He was alone in meditation upon the past, the present, and his future plans. His mighty frame shook as with a tempest. An angel from heaven was passing. He called him and entreated an interview with Christ. This was granted him and then related to the Son of God that he repented of his rebellion and wished again the favour of God. He was willing to take the place God had previously assigned him and be under his wise command. Christ wept at Satan's will, but told him as the mind of God that he could never be received into heaven. Heaven must not be placed in jeopardy. 
all heaven would be marred should it be received should he be received back for sin and rebellion originated with him the seeds of rebellion were still with within him he had in his rebellion no occasion for his course and he had not only and he had not only hopelessly ruined himself but the host of angels also who would then have been happy in heaven had he remained steadfast the law of god could could redeem the law of god could condemn but could not pardon he repented not of his rebellion because he saw the goodness of god which he had abused it was not possible that his love for god had so increased since his fall that it would lead to a cheerful submission and happy obedience to his law which he had which he had which had been despised the righteousness he revealed in losing the sweet light of heaven and the sense of guilt which forced itself upon him and the disappointment he experienced himself in not finding his expectations realized were the cause of his grief to the commander of heaven sorry to be to be commander out of heaven was vastly different from being thus honored in heaven the loss he had sustained of all the privileges of heaven seemed too much to be borne he wished to regain these so does anyone have any thoughts about that passage would someone else like, like to read the next uh, couple of paragraphs yeah i can read them okay thanks Thank Satan's hatred increased and results in taunting angels at heaven's gate. This great change of position had not increased his love for God, nor for his wise and just law. When Satan became fully convinced that there was no possibility of his being reinstated in the favor of God, he manifested his malice with increased hatred and fiery vehemence. God knew that such determined rebellion would not remain inactive. Satan would invent means to annoy the heavenly angels and show contempt for his authority. As he could not gain admission within the gates of heaven, he would wait just at the entrance to taunt the angels and seek contention with them as they were in and out, went in and out. Satan's designs toward Adam and Eve. He would seek to destroy the happiness of Adam and Eve. He would endeavor to incite them to rebellion, knowing that this would cause grief in heaven. His followers were seeking him, and he aroused himself, and assuming a look of defiance, informed them of his plan to wrest from God the noble Adam and his companion Eve. If he could in any way beguile them to disobedience, God would make some provision whereby they might be pardoned, and then himself and all the fallen angels would be in a fair way to share with them of God's mercy. If this should fail, they could unite with Adam and Eve. For when once they should transgress the law of God, they would be subjects of God's wrath, like themselves. Their transgression would place them also in a state of rebellion, and they would or could unite with Adam and Eve, take possession of Eden, and hold it as their home. And if they could gain access to the tree of life in the midst of the garden, their strength would, they thought, be equal to that of the holy angels, and even God himself could not expel them. Okay, thank you, Alvin. So there was a the sort of hope that Satan has that if he is able to make Adam and Eve fall, that God would forgive them, and therefore there's a possibility then that he maybe change his mind in some way, 
offer that mercy uh, to Satan as well. But if not, well, we can just sort of take possession of the earth. And uh, so there was other worlds existing at this year time that Satan doesn't seem to have uh, had uh, any inclination to try to deceive. Uh, he was more focused on Adam and Eve because that was really what the beginning of the contention was when he was jealous at, when, when uh, Christ and God the Father went in to consult about making the, the earth and uh, Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve um, and this earth is, even though there's other unfallen worlds, my understanding is um, they're different than earth. So, um, you know, Adam and Eve are able to reproduce. I'm not sure if that's the case on other planets. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. no, I, I, all my... It's a special, it's a special case. The creation of Adam and Eve is a special mm-hmm. case. Uh, there is a statement that might do say that there was trees in the other gardens, in the other mm-hmm. worlds, that they didn't partake of the fruit of. Mm-hmm. Um, but whether they could reproduce or not, I'm not too sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. So one of my thoughts was, well, would Eve, would Adam and Eve have fallen, have not Satan tempted them? You know, so the other the other worlds maybe didn't have that element of temptation uh, offered them. So they they were maybe it was maybe like a Adam and Eve were put in a more precarious situation. Mm-hmm. So the next paragraph: uh, consultation and contemplations. Satan held a consultation with his evil angels. They did not all readily unite to engage in this hazardous and terrible work. He told them that he would not entrust any one of them to accomplish this work, for he thought that he alone had the wisdom sufficient to carry forward so important an enterprise. He wished them to consider the matter while he should leave them and seek retirement to mature his plans. He sought to impress upon them that that, that this was their last and only hope. If they feel here all prospect of regaining and controlling heaven or any part of God's creation was hopeless, Satan went alone to mature plans that would most surely secure the fall of Adam and Eve. He had fears that his purposes might be defeated. And again, even if he should be successful in leading Adam and Eve to disobey the commandment of God and thus become transgressors of his law and no good come, and no good come to himself, his own case would not be improved. His guilt would only be increased. He shuddered at the thought of plunging the holy happy pair into into the misery and remorse he himself was enduring. He seemed in a state of indecision, at one time firm and determined, then hesitating and wavering. His angels were seeking him, their leader to acquaint him with their decision they will unite with Satan in his plans and with him bear the responsibility and share the consequences. So they're all for Satan carrying out his purpose to uh, bring uh, even probably more than Lucifer himself or Satan himself uh, to uh, bring the fall of Adam and Eve. So decisions and methods are determined. Satan casts off his feelings of despair and weakness and, as their leader, fortified himself to brave out the matter and to do all in his power to defy the authority of God and his son. He acquainted them with his plans. If he should come boldly upon Adam and Eve and make complaints to God's own son, they would not listen to him for a moment, but would be prepared for such an attack. Should he seek to intimidate them because of his power, so recently an angel in high authority, he could accomplish nothing. He decided that cunning and deceit would uh, would do what might and force could not. Um, Theodore, could you read the next one for me, please? The next paragraph. Yep. Two angels visit Adam and Eve to warn them of Satan. 
God assembled the angelic host to take measures to avert the threatened evil. It was decided in heaven's council for angels to visit Eden and warn Adam that he was in danger from the foe. Two angels sped on their way to visit our first parents. The holy pair received them with joyful innocence, expressing their grateful thanks to their creator for thus surrounding them with such a profusion of his bounty. Everything lovely and attractive was theirs to enjoy, and everything seemed wisely adapted to their wants. And that which they prized above all other blessings was the society of the Son of God and the heavenly angels. For they had much to relate to to them at every visit of their new discoveries and of the beauties of nature and um, in their lovely Eden home. And they had many questions to ask relative to many things which they could but indistinctly comprehend. The angels graciously and lovingly gave them the information they desired. They also gave them the sad history of Satan's rebellion and fall. They then distinctly informed them that the tree of knowledge was placed in the garden to be a pledge of their obedience and love to God. That the high and happy estate of the holy angels was to be retained upon condition of obedience. That they were similarly situated that they could obey the law of God and be inexpressibly happy or disobey and lose their highest state and be plunged into hopeless despair. They told Adam and Eve that God would not compel them to obey, that he had not removed from them power to go contrary to his will, that they were moral agents free to obey or disobey. There was but one prohibition that God had seen fit to lay upon them as yet. If they should transgress the will of God, they would surely die. They told Adam and Eve that the most exalted angel next in order to Christ refused obedience to the law of God, which he had ordained to govern govern heavenly beings. That this rebellion had caused war in heaven, which resulted in the rebellious being expelled therefrom. And every angel was driven out of heaven who united with him in questioning the authority of the great Jehovah. And that this fallen foe was now an enemy to all that concerned the interest of God and his dear son. They told them that Satan proposed to do them harm. And it was necessary for them to be guarded. For they might come in contact with the fallen foe. But he could not harm them while they yielded obedience to God's command. For if necessary, every angel from heaven would come to their help rather than that he should in any way do them harm. But if they disobeyed the command of God, then Satan would have power to ever annoy, perplex, and trouble them. If they remained steadfast against the first insinuations of Satan, they were as secure as the heavenly angels. But if they yielded to the tempter, he who spared not the exalted angels would not spare them. They must suffer the penalty of their transgression, for the law of God was as sacred as himself. And he required implicit obedience from all in heaven and on earth. The angels cautioned Eve not to separate from her husband in her employment, for she might be brought into contact with this fallen foe. If separated from each other, they would be in greater danger than if both were together. The angels charged them to closely follow the instructions God had given them in reference to the tree of knowledge. For in perfect obedience, they were safe. And this fallen foe could not, could then have no power to deceive them. God would not permit Satan to follow the holy pair with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, uh, thank you, Theodore. So Satan is riled, hearing their praise. Adam and Eve assured the angels that they should never transgress the express command of God. For it was their highest pleasure to do his will. The angels united with Adam and Eve in holy strains of harmonious music. And as their songs pealed forth from blissful Eden, Satan heard the sound of their strains of joyful adoration to the Father and the Son. And as Satan heard it, his envy, hatred and malignity increased, and he expressed his anxiety to his followers to incite Adam and Eve to disobedience and at once bring down the wrath of God upon them and change their songs of praise to hatred and curses to their maker. 
Okay, uh, just a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this in this um, timelines, because we we know that there is from the creation of the angels, there's ages before sin enters, right? And then we have the creation of the earth, and and then we're going to have and the way that it's worded here, I mean, they're they're in close proximity to each other. That is the fall of Lucifer and the creation of the earth, right? These yes. are occurring. Yeah. I, I think she even says immediately. Yeah. After after Lucifer was expelled, God then just went to his purpose to create the earth. On yeah. Own. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what it seems like. Now, now then they're going to be told uh, that Lucifer has fallen. And now it seems like almost it's as if he has just fallen, or at least that his plans about what he's he's thinking about doing with Adam and Eve, you know, uh, that, that that would be known to God, what Satan is thinking, right? So so angels come and warn them. Um, now, there's nothing yet at this in, in seeing how long it is from when Adam and Eve are warned to when sin occurs. Miguel White gives no hints about this. Mm -hmm. Right. So far, I mean, it's always that big question. How long is it from when Adam and Eve were created to when they sinned? Because my understanding is the 6,000 years that Ellen White tends to count it from when Adam and Eve sinned. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's just it's just a question, an observation. Yeah, there, there was a statement that uh, I came across as I was studying the book of Genesis with Ellen mm -hmm. White comments, and she was talking about the curse that came upon Cain, and then she re referred to the violence that was going to come upon the earth. Well, the flood. The, flood, the flood came upon the earth, but that was the result of violence, and that violence can be marked 120 years uh, before the, the ark, uh, well, the, before the flood uh, was occurred because then you had the, the ark coming so the ark was being built there was that balance already happening then and so i sort of she mentions a period of 1500 years so okay. again it could be just like a, a ballpark Around. figure so i'm my thinking is that she's counting back 1500 years from that beginning of the 120 years to when cain killed Able. Able. So that's about 36 years after creation. Yes. So to me, that's a wee bit short, but you know, because you had to, you had to have Cain and uh, Abel being born. It is still viable, but to me, it's and then it's going to be like another uh, almost 100 years to when Seth is born as a replacement. Yeah. You no. Know, so. Yeah. So I, I think. I just round it off. Yeah, so she does lots of rounding. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that, interesting. But yeah, but that that's the only thing I've seen that if you were gonna take her words there as being precise, that would mean that uh Cain killed Abel thirty six years after creation. Yeah. So they must have been young men, whatever at the time. Yeah. And then the, the time period when sin occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, must must be not long either. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, if she says it's it's fifteen hundred, it wouldn't be fourteen hundred, mm -hmm. right? So you understand. Well, what I'm mm -hmm. Yes. Like it's not going to be around the time when Seth is born, which is going to be. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. So the next session here. Well, that's really the. Uh, the history then to when we get to the, the temptation. Mm -hmm. So Satan possesses the serpent. In order to accomplish his work unperceived, Satan chose to employ as his medium the serpent, a disguise well adapted for his purpose of deception. The serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful.
beautiful creatures on the earth. It had wings and while flying through the air, presented an appearance of dazzling brightness, having the color and brilliancy of burnished gold. He did not go upon the ground, but went from place to place through the air and ate fruit like a man. Satan entered into the serpent and took his position in the tree of knowledge, resting in the rich laden branches of the forbidden tree and regaling itself with the delicious fruit. It was an object to arrest the attention and delight the eye of the beholder. Thus, in the garden of peace, lurked the destroyer, watching for his prey. So Eve and the serpent. Eve unconsciously at first, separated from her husband in her employment. When she became aware of the fact, she felt that there might be a danger, but again she thought herself secure. Even if she did not remain close by the side of her husband, she had wisdom and strength to know if evil came and to meet it. This the angels had cautioned her not to do. Eve found herself gazing with mingling curiosity and admiration upon the fruit of the forbidden tree. She saw it was lovely, very lovely, and was reasoning with herself. She saw it was very lovely and was reasoning with herself why God had decidedly prohibited her uh, their eating and or touching it. Now was Satan's opportunity. He addressed her as though he had been able to to divine her thoughts. Yea, hath God said, "Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden." Thus far every word that Satan spoke was truth, but his manner of saying them was disguised to, was with his, but his manner of saying them saying them was a disguised contempt for the words of God. There was in his words a truth, a covert negative, a denial, a doubt of the divine truthfulness. He sought to instill into her mind the thought that God would not do as he had said, that the withholding of such a beautiful fruit was a contradiction of his, of his love and compassion for them. Thus with soft words and pleasant, sorry, thus with soft and pleasant words and with musical voice, he addressed the wandering Eve. She was startled to hear Serpent speak. He extolled her beauty and exceeding loveliness which was not displeasing to Eve. But she was amazed, for she knew that to the servant God had not given the power of speech. Eve's curiosity was aroused. Instead of fleeing from the spot, she listened to hear the servant talk. It did not occur to her that it might be that fallen foe, using the servant as a medium. It was Satan that spoke, not the servant. Eve was beguiled, flattered, infatuated. Had she been, had she met a commanding personage possessing a form like the angels and resembling them, she would have been upon her guard. But that strange voice should have driven her uh, to her husband's side to inquire of him why another should thus freely address her. But she enters into a controversy with the serpent. She answers his question, we may not, sorry, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The servant answers, ye shall not surely die, for God knoweth that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Maybe someone else could read, read the next paragraph for me, please. Okay, next next paragraph here. Uh, word about Satan's pro, pro, propositions, that one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Satan would convey the idea that by eating of the forbidden tree, they would receive a new and more noble kind of knowledge than they had hitherto attained. This has been his special work with great success ever since his fall. 
to lead men to pry into secrets of the Almighty and not to be satisfied with what God has revealed and not uh, and not careful to obey that which he has commanded. He would lead them to disobey God's commands, then make them believe that they are entering uh, a wonderful field of knowledge. This is purely a supposition and a miserable deception. They fail to understand what God has revealed and, and disregard his explicit commandments and aspire after wisdom independent of God and seek to understand that which he has been pleased to withhold uh, from morals, uh, mortals. Uh, they are elated with their idea of uh, progress, progression and charmed with their own vain philosophy. Uh, but grope in midnight darkness relative to true knowledge. They are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It was not the will of God that the sinless pair should have any knowledge of evil. Uh, he had freely given them the good, but withhold the evil. Uh, Eve, just a minute. Uh, Eve thought the words of the serpent wise. And she received the broad assertion, He shall not surely die, for God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, <clears throat> making God a liar. Saint boldly insinuates that God deceived them to keep them from being exalted in knowledge equal themselves. God said, if ye eat, ye shall surely die. The serpent said, if ye eat, ye shall surely not die. Ye shall not surely die. Thanks, Jeff. Uh -huh. uh, so we maybe to the next paragraph. Uh, Satan's allurement continues. So the tender assured Eve that as soon as she ate of the fruit, she would receive a new and superior knowledge that would make her equal with God. He called her attention, attention to himself. He ate freely off the tree and found it, uh, uh, and found it not only uh, perfectly harmless, but delicious and exhilarating, and told her that it was because of its wonderful properties to impart wisdom and power that God had prohibited them from tasting or even touching it, for he knew its wonderful qualities. He stated that by eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, sorry, he stated that by eating of the fruit of the tree forbidden them was the reason he had attained the power of speech. He had intimated that God would not carry out his word. It was merely a threat to intimidate them and to keep them from great good. He further told them that they could not die. He had, had they not eaten of the tree, of life, which perpetuates immortality. Uh, sorry, had they not eaten off the tree? Uh, he told them. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, he told them. He further told them that they should not, that they could not die, had they not eaten off the tree of life, which perpetuates immortality. Um, he said that God was deceiving them to keep them from a higher state of felicity and more exalted happiness. While Satan claimed to have uh, received great good by eating of the forbidden tree, he did not let it appear that by transgression he had become an outcast from heaven. The tempter plucked the fruit and passed it to Eve. She took it in her hand. Now, I said the tempter, you were prohibited from touching it, from even touching it, lest you die. He told her that she would realize no more sense of evil and death in eating than in touching and handling the fruit. Eve was emboldened because she felt 
not they made it a signs of God's displeasure. She thought the words of the, the tempter all wise and correct. She ate and was delighted with the fruit. It seemed delicious to her taste. And she imagined that she realized herself and the what herself the wonderful effects of the fruit. She plucked it for herself. She plucked for herself off the fruit and ate and imagined um reading us again, Mama. It's quite similar, sorry. She she plucked the fruit for herself off the fruit she, sorry. she then plucked for herself off the fruit and ate. And imagine she felt the quickening power of a new and elevated existence as a result of the exhilarating influence of the forbidden fruit. There was nothing poisonous in the fruit, and the sin is not there in the failure of appetite. Eve, infatuated, flattered, beguiled, did not discern the deception. She coveted what God had forbidden. She trusted his wisdom. Um, and she cast away faith, the key of knowledge. Maybe Theodore could read the next one. Okay. Eve confronts Adam. She was in a strange and unnatural excitement as she sought her husband with her hands, um, with her hands held, filled with the forbidden fruit. She related to him the wise discourse of the serpent and wished to conduct him at once to the tree of knowledge. She told him she had eaten of the fruit, and instead of her feeling any sense of death, she realized a pleasing, exhilarating influence. As soon as Eve had disobeyed, she became a powerful medium through which to occasion the fall of her husband. I saw a sadness come over the countenance of Adam. He appeared afraid and astonished. A struggle appeared to be going on in his mind. He told Eve he was quite certain that this was the foe that had been that they had been warned against, and if so, that she must die. She assured him she felt no ill effects, but rather a very pleasant influence and entreated him to eat. Adam quite well understood that his companion had transgressed the only prohibition laid upon them as a test of their fidelity and love. Eve reasoned that the serpent said that they should not die, and his words must be true. For she felt no signs of God's displeasure, but a pleasant influence. And as she imagined, the angels felt it. Adam regretted that Eve had left his side, but now the deed was done. He must be separated from her whose society he had loved so well. How could he have it thus? His love for Eve was strong, and in utter discouragement, he resolved to share her fate. He reasoned that Eve was a part of himself, and if she must die, he would die with her for he could not bear the thought of separation from her. He lacked faith in his merciful and benevolent creator. He did not think that God, who had formed him out of the dust of the ground into a living, beautiful form, and had created Eve to be his companion, could supply her place. After all, might not the words of this wise serpent be correct? Eve was before him, just as lovely and beautiful and apparently as innocent as before this act of disobedience. She expressed greater, higher love for him than before her disobedience as the effects of the fruit she had eaten. He saw in her no signs of death. She had told him of the happy influence of the fruit of her ardent love for him, and he decided to brave the consequences. He seized the fruit and quickly ate it, and like Eve, felt not immediately its ill effects. Your mic is off. Oh, sorry. I was just saying it's uh, nearly the R is up. Yeah. I'm just saying maybe end there. Yep. So we could just go on and on. Mm -hmm. So we just close the prayer. Yep. Okay, let's pray. Your loving Heavenly Father, uh, because thanks for this, the words that uh, we've been able to read. That gives us insight into that which trans uh, transpired in the ancient times, and we um, we contemplate these things and see that your law is holy and just, and that uh, is demands our obedience 
and that we find our happiness in obeying it. And that we pray that we can be loyal to you and withstand the um, deceptions, temptations, and attacks upon us by Satan and his uh, hosts and those who are united with him. Pray that we can be firm to your law and uphold it as the standard of righteousness and um, that, to know that there is a way to eternal life is keeping your commandments uh, through the grace given to our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And um, we ask your blessing upon us for those that uh, the Sabbath day is continuing and be with us in the following week in the new year that we uh, can be representing you to this here earth that should soon to perish. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.